this is Deborah Kitko, Genealogy Librarian with the Wayne County Public Library. As you remember, several months ago, this is pre-COVID-19, I had actually started recording a couple of case studies. And I've promised you a third case study in that series, and I had finally completed it. So um, we've already looked at Ralph Albert Keener, we've looked at Benjamin Harrison Keener, and today we're going to look at Isaac Franklin Keener. So um, today, I'm hoping you're enjoying these series, and um, let's get to it. Today we're going to take a look at a case study involving Isaac Franklin Keener. This would be my third great-grandfather. When you're doing research, it's quite common to encounter conflicts. Um, it could be a difference between the dates, like a year that they were born, it could be a difference in the day they were died, it could be, you know, a discrepancy in terms of the parents may be, um, their birthplace. Whatever the conflict may be, it's our job as researchers to actually resolve these conflicts. If you're not sure how to resolve conflicts, one excellent tool for providing some information would be to read and study other case studies that individuals have done. You can actually find case studies written up in professional journals, professional genealogy journals, such as the National Genealogical Society Quarterly, um, also in uh, even the Ohio Genealogical Society's publication. You may even find more simplified case studies written, written up in local society newsletters. So uh, if you don't take the opportunity to actually read and study some of these case studies, I'd recommend you that you would actually begin trying to take a look at some of these, find one that would interest you, and discover how other researchers have resolved conflicts within their research. As you may know, while you're trying to resolve one conflict, other conflicts within the data may actually arise. Whenever this happens, I'm going to encourage you to set aside those new conflicts. You'll want to address those later. It is way too easy for us to actually hop down a bunny trail. So you actually begin doing, what I mean is that you begin doing research, and then before you know it, you, you try to follow this other line, and then before you know it, you're on like two or three other bunny trails that have nothing to relate to what the original path you were on. So if you are trying to resolve conflict, you have a certain goal in mind or a certain objective in mind, you want to make sure that you just stick to that objective. Any other conflicts that may come up, you can make a notation of it and just set it aside and we'll take care of that at a later point. Just as a re reminder here, um, this is just a, basically my genealogy looking at my father's side of the family. So we have myself at the very bottom here. You have my parents, uh, Ralph J. Keener and Ruth M. Wayne. You have my paternal grandparents, Ralph Albert Keener and Anna Sylvia Verado. My great-grandparents, Benjamin Harrison Keener and Dula Delight Doherty. My great-great-grandparents, Isaac Franklin Keener and Melissa Jane Inyart. And my third great-grandparent, Abraham L. Keener and Martha Jane Davis. Now today we're actually going to take a look at my great Great grandfather, but we're also going to have to take a look at our, at my third great grandfather as we're trying to resolve some conflict with my second great grand grandfather. As a review, in the first case case study that I had done involving Ralph Albert Keener, we actually learned how important it was to verify all the information regardless of the source. We had started out with a find a grave record, which ended up having inaccurate information. Now, a lot of the information provided on Find a Grave is considered secondary, so or like an authored work. So the accuracy of that information is dependent on the individual who is submitting the information on that particular memorial. Anytime you have secondary information or authored works, you want to make sure you do the research to try to discover the original resources. This may involve, you know, researching vital records and U.S. Census records. Um, through these main resources, we were actually able to verify that the birthplace of Ralph Albert Keener was actually Allen County, Indiana, and not Ohio, as previously mentioned on the Find a Grave website. 
We also realize that although these are government documents, that does not necessarily guarantee the accuracy of them. In the case of my grandfather, we realized that the, that the U.S. Census records sometimes just provide some inaccurate information. This was also discovered in the second case study that we did in terms of Benjamin Harrison Keener. In both cases, we also realized that the census records provide additional clues that we may or may not have been aware of. And these clues can provide additional resources for you to check in. So you want to make sure that you pay attention to the smallest of details given on these records, whether they're a death record, a birth record, a marriage record, um, a cemetery record, like a uh, inscription of a tombstone, a, you know, U.S. Census records, anything you'd want to pay attention to those smallest of details. We also learned in the previous case studies that sometimes names may be recorded with different spellings. Um, Keener, for example, has been found as K-U-N-E-R in addition to the K-E-E-N-E-R. But not only do you find variable spellings within the last name, you may find different spellings within a first name. Elizabeth could be spelled with a Z or with an S. You may find that they may have used nicknames. For example, a common nickname for Sarah would be Sadie, or a nickname for Mary would be Polly. Uh, so some, or sometimes they may even use their middle name. For example, if you have an ancestor whose name is Mary Elizabeth, she could go by Mary, she could go by Elizabeth, she could go by Eliza, she could go by Libby or Lizzie. Um, she may even just go by the initials M-E. And the, um, going by initials sometimes is presents a problem, and we're going to take a look specifically at that example in today's case study. In the case of Benjamin Harrison Keener, we discovered that there was a conflict in his birth year. The records indicated that he had been born sometime between 1888 and 1890, and it was my objective to try to resolve this conflict. I wanted to figure out for sure when he was born. And of course, we also talked briefly about the destruction of the 1890 U.S. Census, and since Benjamin was um, born in 1888, 1890. Not having that 1890 census presents a, it just presents one less resource for us to use to try to verify his birth information. Through a look at the census records, we did discover that Benjamin's age was consistent with each of the U.S. census records. According to the index on ancestry, it estimated that his birth year was about 1889. The only exception was the 1900 U.S. Census. So we had to kind of resolve that issue. We also keep in mind <clears throat> that he was actually not born until November. And the U.S. Census records are usually taken in the spring or early summer of each year. So the result would be that, you know, his birthday would not have actually followed suit at the time that the census was taken. So knowing that information... Rather than his estimated birth rate being 1889, it's probably 1888. We took a look at the 1900 U.S. Census, the marriage record of his second marriage, his World War II draft registration card, and his find a grave entry. All of those actually confirm that he was born on, in November of 1888. His first marriage record was the odd record out. It stated he was born in November 1890. When you're looking at these documents, you actually want to analyze them. You want to sort of think outside the box. Would there be any reason whatsoever for him to not give a truthful age on the marriage record? The answer in this particular case would be yes. His bride was about seven years younger, so he may have wanted to appear a little bit younger on the marriage record. So instead of being, you know, like nine years apart, you know, you, or seven years apart, he wanted to create that he's only like five years apart. So because of this reasoning, I'm just kind of like throwing out that birth date that was provided on his first marriage record, since all the others actually collaborate and confirm that he was born in November 1888. Case study number three is going to take a look at Isaac Franklin Keener. This is my second great-grandfather. In this case, we want to try to complete a family group of Isaac Franklin Keener. What I mean by that, we want to try to figure out the names, um, not necessarily of Isaac Franklin Keener's family, but I want to try to create 
recreate the family of Isaac Freeman Keener's parents and then his siblings. So, but in addition to that, we also want to verify the birth parents of Isaac Keener. So, uh, we're going to try to determine the, the birth parents of Isaac Keener and then try to recreate the family group that would include Isaac's parents and the siblings. An entry on Find a Grave indicates that Isaac Keener was the son of Abraham L. and Jane Davis Keener. This is from Find a Grave Memorial number 10471862. This particular entry provides the marriage date of the 29th of May, 1873 in Wabash County, Indiana. Find a Grave includes a lot of secondary information, and so although it is a great resource, you want to try to verify that information that is included on there. Uh, a lot of the information is considered like an authored work or with secondary information. Um, accurate information is, is dependent on whoever has submitted the memorial and added the information. So in order to try to verify this marriage date, I want to try to obtain a copy of the original marriage record. In addition, on Find a Grave, there are a couple other obituaries, but these are just transcripts um, or excerpts of an of the obituary. I'm not sure if these are the full obituary or just part of the obituary. So at some point in my research, I want to try to obtain copies of the original obituary to make sure that everything was included accurately and completely. These are the two abstracts or excerpts that we find on Find a Grave. One was from the Journal Gazette from Fort Wayne, Indiana, which is in Allen County. And this was in the newspaper on Sunday, May 7, 1916. And this particular obituary indicates that Isaac Keener was age 68 at the time that he died. Um, he was at the hospital, St. Joseph Hospital. And it goes on to say that he actually came from Fort Wayne from Logansport about three weeks ago to make his home with his son. His son being named Benjamin Keener, and it gives their address. And eight days ago, he was, he was taken to the hospital. The obituary further indicates that he is survived by four daughters, two sons, one brother, and a sister, but no names are given. From the Wabash Plain Dealer in Wabash, Indiana, dated on Thursday, May 11, 1916, on page 4, from the Legro News newspaper, it just mentioned that Isaac Keener had passed away in a sanatorium in Fort Wayne last Monday and is buried at the Odd Fellow Cemetery at this place last Tuesday. He had been in failing health for some time past, and the death of his son, but a few weeks since, rather hastened the end, meaning that apparently another son had preceded his father in death here. He was a resident practically all of his life in this locality, referring to Wabash, Indiana, and he left a family of several members, a number of friends and relatives to mourn his departure. So once again, on this obituary, you find out where he's buried at, you don't have the name of his son. On the first obituary, you don't have the burial date, but you do have the name of the son. So this is, when you're working with obituaries, especially the earlier ones, you want to look to see if there's more than one newspaper for the county in which your resident had lived or where they may have come from recently, in recent months. There's a good possibility that, you know, two obituaries, or maybe even a third obituary, they may all include slightly different information, some may include less information, some may include more information. So you definitely want to check all the local newspapers to see what you can find out. You just never know um, what may be included in those local newspapers at the time. Something to note on Find a Grave, um, neither of the obituary provides a birth date. However, an approximate death date can be calculated. It gives that his age was about 68 years old, so he was born about 1848. His parents' names aren't given. Um, it does include survivors, but once again, no names are given, except for one son, Benjamin Keener. And then, of course, no marriage information is included within either of those obituaries. There is no photo of the tombstone on Find a Grave. I do not know if there is a tombstone and it just wasn't uploaded or if no marker actually exists there in the cemetery. I'd probably need to contact someone over there or make the trip over there and see if I can actually 
locate the cemetery and try to find the tombstone if one does exist. So the dates that were given on Find a Grave are October 26, 1847. He was born in Randolph County, Indiana, and he died May 6, 1916 in Fort Wayne, Allen County, Indiana. So at this point, I did not know if this information was coming from the tombstone or it was just this is just other resources that the individual has found on Isaac Keener, to, and she has just added this information to the Find a Grave record. So once again, I want to try to verify this information. I do want to try to verify the birth date. I want to try to find the, the death date. I want to try to find out who those siblings would be. Um, I also want to try to find out who his kids would be also. So I guess when I said earlier about the family group, I'm not only interested in Isaac Keener's family unit, but I'm also would be interested in whoever his father and that family unit as well. Now, Ancestry does have some Indiana death certificates. They also have the WPA death records. Um, it took some digging around, but I finally located the death certificate of Isaac Keener. And one of the reasons I had problems was it was indexed underneath Isaiah, I-S-A-I-H, as opposed to Isaac. So remember, when you're actually trying to search some of these records, you may want to look outside of the box, I think outside the box. Um, there are mistakes in the spelling of names. Other names could be used. I don't know if this is just a typographical error, if the computer software misinterpreted the letter, or what may happen. Once I look at the actual death certificate, I may have a better idea about how they, why it was interpreted as Isaiah as opposed to Isaac. However, on the WPA death index through Ancestry from 1882 to 1920, there is an abstract that indicates that he died on May 6, 1916, Fort Wayne. He was age 67 years. And this has been recorded there at the City Health Office in Fort Wayne, book CH-8 on page 33. And this is part of a series produced by the Indiana Works Progress Administration. And I give the other citation there as well. So I, here is the actual death certificate, and you can definitely see the way how they have the name spell here. It definitely does look like Isaiah as opposed to Isaac. Um, you also notice on this death certificate that his wife's name is given as Melissa, and that appears to be misspelled as well. You'll notice that um, the name of the father is given as Abraham Keener. The name of his mother is given as Martha Davis. And this further indicates that the birthplace of the father would be Pennsylvania, and the birthplace of the mother is Tennessee. So this information on the death certificate is actually secondary information. This is dependent on who the informant was and how informed that individual was. If you look right below that, it says that the informant, it just gives the last name Keener. So that doesn't really help a whole lot in terms of providing information in terms of who gave this information on this death certificate at the time. Now, the actual death date, being May 6, 1916, would be considered primary information. And this goes on, it says that um, this individual had actually attended the deceased from April 21st, 1916 to May 6th, 1916. And so this is from the MD, and so, you know, and it gives the, the cause of death, so you would think this is all pretty accurate based on um, the analysis made by the doctor, by the attending doctor. And it just says, place of burial or removal be La Grille, Indiana. So that would sort of go hand in hand with what the obituary indicated that he was being buried at the Oddfellow Cemetery of Wabash, Indiana. The Grove is a township in Wabash County, Indiana. So here is a, just an abstract form of the death certificate. Um, if you'll notice on the death certificate, they have crossed out the age of 68 and put the year 67 in there, which changes the birth date around a little bit. Um, but we still want to try to verify, because remember, the birth date 
you know, and the father's information, mother's information is all secondary. So the obituary states he was 68 at the time of his death, which gives his birthday as 1848. Now, the obituary and the death certificate are not independent resources. What I mean by that is that the same person who provided the information for the death certificate is probably the same individual who gave the information to the newspaper. So when you're looking at documents, you want to try to find two independent documents to try to verify the information. And of course, you know, if you go with what was given on the birth certificate, his, um, as being 67 years, 6 months, and 10 days, his calculated birth date would be 26 of October 1848. However, they had originally crossed, they had crossed out the 68 to put in the 67. So you now, um, have that he would have been born October 26, 1847. So right now it just really depends on whether he's born 1847 or 1848. There's a little discrepancy there. We want to take a look at some the marriage record also. Remember, the find a grave record indicated that he was married about March 29th in 1873. Ancestry does have the Indiana Marriages Index online. There's also a card, and I think this is through Family Search, that indicated that he was married on the 19th of March 1873 in Wabash County, Indiana. Not the 29th of March 1873. So right now I have a discrepancy. I have two different marriage dates given for the marriage of, of Isaac Keener. So I have to resolve this conflict before I go any further. And the best way to resolve this conflict would be to try to obtain a copy of the original marriage record. So this is just a marriage card that was available through Family Search, And you see that it gives reference that they are married March 19th, 1873. It's recorded in Book 8 on page 137, and there you have the spelling of Melissa, um, M-E-L-I-S-S-A, as opposed to the normal, as opposed to the spelling that was given in a death certificate. So I want to try, you know, once again, this is just, this marriage card is just an abstract of the marriage. I actually want to try to locate the original marriage record. So I go on to Family Search. And I've done this before, and I realized that in order to access the marriage records for Wabash County, Indiana, I have to be at an affiliate library or at the um, Family History Library. The, this is one of the resources based on the contracts that they've made with different entities that you cannot access these records free of charge from home. Um, when you work with Family Search, there's like three different tiers, and we can talk about this at a later session. But you have one tier where, you know, the information is available for anyone at home with a login. You have another tier that's available at affiliate libraries as well as the family history libraries. And you have a third tier in which they only permit access to the records at the family history center or family history library. So in this case, you know, to access this marriage record, I came to the local library. Um, to try to find this marriage record. And I actually went through the online catalog for Family Search. A lot of people focus just on doing the search in Family Search. I like going into the catalog and seeing what resources would be available. And that's how I ended up finding this marriage record for Isaac Keener and Melissa J. Inyard. And if you read down through here, it shows that they had applied for the marriage license on the 19th of March, 1873. If you read down through, you'll find out that they actually were not married until the 20th of March, 1873. So not only was the find a grave record wrong, but the abstract marriage card index was wrong also. According to this marriage record, it shows that they were indeed married on March 20th, 1873, not on the 29th and not on the 19th. By looking at this original record, you can also pick up a other, couple other pieces of information. Number one, you're going to see who they're married by. So you have a Reverend John R. Brown. So this, you know, you want to do some research in Wabash County to find out what church John R. Brown may have been the minister of. And you can try to see if any church records still exist for that particular record, which may give you another um, source for some additional information on the family. But the other thing that you find about midway through this record, you'll find 
Jackson Inyard, father was present. So this is providing you direct evidence that Jackson Inyard was the father of a Melissa J. Inyard. So that's another terrific piece of information that was not included on Find a Grave, and it was not included on the Family Search index card for Wabash County, Indiana. You only discovered this additional information by viewing the original record. Thus, that's why I encourage you to try to find those original records if at all possible. You'll also notice that the marriage record was filed nearly a month after, a little more than a month after the marriage actually took place. If so if Isaac Keener was born either in 1847 or 1848, died in 1916, he should be found in the, the census records from 1850 through 1910. Keep in mind, 1890 does not exist, and so that is one source we do not have to verify. Based on this marriage record, we know he's married in 1873, so I'm hoping that I, should, I will find him with his parents who according to the death certificate, is Abraham and Martha in the 1850, 1860, and 1870 census. Um, of course, none of these census records actually provide relationships, although you can infer some in relationships given these records. Although, you know, we do want to make sure we check every single one of the census records because each one may provide a little additional information on the individual you're researching. And you don't want to miss an opportunity for additional clues. So we're, like with genealogy, you start with the most recent and you work way backwards. So he died in 1916, so the most recent census that he's going to be in would be the 1910 census record. Before we look at those census records specifically, I'm going to just give you a basic timeline of Isaac F. Keener. Um, based on what information I have actually found to to date, and some information I'm going to share a little later on within this presentation. So we know 1916, he dies at Fort Wayne in Allen County, Indiana. In the 1911 director for Fort Wayne, he is listed as a resident. And keep in mind that the records are usually one year behind. So the 1911 directory would actually indicate that he was a resident of Fort Wayne in about 1910. Sure enough, the 1910 census, which is enumerated on April 19th, indicates that he is residing in Fort Wayne, Indiana. I go ahead and look in the 1910 directory um, for Wabash County, Indiana. Um, this was available online. And it shows that he's residing there in Wabash County and not Allen County. And based on the idea that the directory is run about a year behind, he was in Wabash County in 1909, and then he moved to Fort Wayne, Indiana sometime between 1909 and April 19, 1910. In the 1900 census, he is residing with his wife and kids, and they're residing in Lagoa Township, Wabash County, Indiana. Likewise, with 1880 and 1873, we know he marries Melissa Inyard. In 1870, um, I'm assuming that he is in Wabash County, Indiana, with his parents and siblings. And as we go through this presentation, you'll see that this was confirmed. Likewise, in 1860, he's in Wabash County. And in 1850, I actually find him um, in Green Township, Randolph County, Indiana. And he was born in 1847, 1848, depending on, you know, um, the records that we look at. So this is just an abstract of the 1910 census, um, where Isaac Keener is ahead of the household. He's age 63. So see, MI, that means that this is his first marriage, and he's been married for 36 years. This particular census indicates he was born in Indiana and both of his parents were born in Tennessee. So right now you're now having a discrepancy between, you know, the birthplace of Abraham Keener given as Pennsylvania on his death certificate. And then the 1910 census would indicate that Abraham would have been born in Tennessee. Melissa, his wife, is age 54. This is her first marriage also. They've been married for 36 years. You'll see 7 7, that means that Melissa has given birth to seven children. All seven are still living. This census indicates that she was born in Indiana, her father was born in Ohio, and her mom was born in Indiana. And here we have at least three of the kids Benjamin H., which confirms the obituary. He's age 21. Inez, who's a daughter, age 17, and Sarah, another daughter, age 14. 
In addition to the census record, there's an Ernest McLean, who's a grandson, age 14, born in Indiana. So we'll want to follow up on him. And then we also have a Philip Fall, who's listed as a son-in-law. He's age 33. This is his first marriage, and he and Grace have been married for eight years, um, both being born in Indiana. And then they have two children at this time, Hugh and Ralph. Apparently, Ralph is a common name within this family. In addition to the grandson and the grandchildren and the son-in-law and the daughter, um, Isaac's sister, Anna, is also residing in this household. So Anna is much younger. Um, Isaac here is close to like 20 years difference between these two siblings. Going back to the 1900 U.S. Census for the Grove Township in Wabash County, um, this indicates that Isaac was actually born October 1843. He's age 56. He's been married for 26 years, born in Indiana, and this particular census indicates that both parents were born in Indiana. Melissa was born April 1866, married for 26 years. Once again, seven kids have been born, all seven still living. She was born in Indiana, and both her parents were born in Ohio. At this point, I'm not sure who is giving the information on the 1900 census. It could have been one of these other kids within the household. It could have been Isaac. It could have been Melissa. I am not sure at this point. So that's part of the reason why you're finding a discrepancy in the birthplaces of the parents. And we also find a couple other kids here. There's an Adolph, Bernie, there's Inez, there's Sadie, there's Ernest, who's a grandson, and Annie, who's a sister. And of course, in this particular record, Ernest has listed underneath the surname of the head of the household being Keener, which we know is not the case according to the 1910 census. So I'm assuming that he is residing with his maternal grandfather and grandmother at this point. Going back another, ten, another 20 years, because 1890 does not exist, we see that Isaac is age 32. He was born in Indiana. And it shows that his parents were both born in Tennessee. Then we have Jay Melissa, who's Indiana, mother being, father being in Ohio, and mother being born in Indiana. And you have Barton, who's age 4. And there's a J. Margaret, age 6, within this household. In addition, there's a Martin Inyard, who's listed as 16 years old and listed as a boarder. I do want to make a side note here. This Martin Inyard, although he's listed as a boarder, I do believe he may be an actual nephew. Um, we know that Isaac Keener married Melissa Inyard. Um, and it mentions that Melissa's father was Jackson Inyard. Uh, so... Um, at this point, I'm not sure if this could be of relations on the mom's side of the family, or it could be one of Isaac's sisters who is married to an inuit as well. So that's another thing I have to try to sort through and figure out on this record. Now, because Isaac was married in 1873, the 1880 census is the first census that he'd be listed with his own family. At this point, we're making the assumption or that we're hoping that he's going to be listed with his parents and siblings in the 1870 census. However, I've had a problem trying to locate him in the 1870 census. Instead of just spinning my wills, um, I just set this problem aside, and I'll revisit it here at a later point. And I went ahead and I looked in the 1860 and 1850 U.S. census records, both Ancestry and Family Search offer an every name index for these census records, which is great these days. So I went ahead and searched for Isaac Keener and those other two census years and see what I could find, find out about it. Um, now, I'll keep in mind when I'm doing a search for Isaac Keener, I'm using what information I know at this point, meaning that Abraham Keener was a father who supposedly was born in Pennsylvania or Tennessee, depending on the census record. We also know that his mother's name was uh, given as Martha Davis, and she was from Tennessee. And I also know that he apparently has at least two siblings. Of course, I do not know their names at this point. So before I pursue, you know, looking in 1860 and 1850, I do have a little additional information on this family. So in the 1860 census, um, I'm making the assumption that they're residing in Wabash County, Indiana. Uh, and I do find one Isaac 
Keener, who would be about the right age, born about the right year, residing in Wilders County. And of course, um, the head of the household is an Abram Keener, aged about 50 in Tennessee, and Jane, aged about 40, also in Tennessee. And there we have several siblings. We have Hetty and Margaret, Sarah, Morgan, Mary, Martha, and Elsa. Mary and Martha being twins. So at least this is confirmed that Isaac was not an only child. He indeed did have some siblings. Just apparently a lot of his siblings passed away before Isaac did. Uh, we also don't see that they owned any property at this point. This personal estate was just probably like cows and horses. In the 1850 census, I do another general search. I do not find Isaac in Wabash County, but I do find an Isaac with an Abraham Keener residing in Randolph County, in the Green Township there in Indiana. And the names match of the siblings. And you have Jane. You don't necessarily have Martha, but you do have Jane. You have Hetty, Margaret E., Sarah C., Rebecca. There's Isaac. There's a William Allen aged nine in Indiana. I'm not sure who this William Allen is. He's another mystery that I will set aside for now until I can figure him out. So I still haven't found the 1870 census. I have found that I have verified that a potential father for Isaac would be Abraham. A potential mother would be Jane. It could be Martha Jane. I do not know that for sure. So I'm going to actually go to the, I want to follow through on Abram or on Abraham and see if I can find him in the 1880 census to see if he is still living. And sure enough, I do a search on him in Indiana. I didn't find him in Wabash. I didn't find him in Randolph. I find him in Polk Township in Huntington County, Indiana. And I see that Abraham is age 75, born in Tennessee. He's a widower. And Rhoda, age 21, who's a daughter, Martha, who's a daughter, and Albert W., at 17, who is a son. And here we have Martin Inyert, who's age 16, who's listed as a grandson. So there's here are three new names that's come across my plate. Now, I have seen Martin Inyert before, residing with Isaac in a later census. I believe also in the 1880 census. Um, we have Rhoda. We have Albert W. Keener, and then, of course, we want to try to figure out who this Martin Inyart may be. We also want to know when did Abraham or Abram Keener move from Wabash County to Huntington County, and I want to verify this is the same one. I do have Abram. I do have Martha. The other two kids I'm not so sure about because those are new names. Martin Inyart, um, I found him with Isaac, so I'm not sure how he ties in either. So I have to try to continue doing research to figure out this information. So let's go ahead and return back to our search in 1870. We now have a little bit more information to work with. We have some possible siblings. We have, you know, some approximate birth years uh, for the parents. Searching in 1870, it took me quite a while, but I finally found the family. One of the problems I encountered was that it is not indexed underneath the name Keener, it is indexed underneath the name K-U-N-E-R. Now, there's a good possibility, if you take a look at this, a double E, if they're kind of like written sloppy, in a sloppy format, could actually represent a U. So, you know, when the person's doing the indexing, they may have interpreted those double E's as a U, thereby, you know, I was indexing a Kuhner instead of Kuhner. But the other problem I encountered with the 1870 census is that the enumerator only included the first letter of the first name of each of the individuals in the household. So when you do a search with Isaac, it's not going to show up because Isaac is not listed. You're not going to find a search with Abraham or Sadie or, or Sarah or any other names because all of them include only the first letter. So I had to do some finagling around to try to discover, you know, try to find Keener in the 1870 census. And here they are. They are in Legro Township. You have... You'll see here, if you know that it's Keener, K-E-E-N-E-R, you can clearly see that. There's a couple of loops there. However, to an, uh, an I who's not familiar with the family or with the names within this, this township, um, you can easily see how they interpret that to be K-U-N-E-R. And so you have A, who's a farmer, and he does have real estate by this point. He's born in Tennessee. 
You have Jay, who's keeping the house, who I'm assuming would be the wife. And then you have the inferred kids being I, M, 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 A, and E, A. And then you have two inured boys in here. You have an A inured and you have an M inured. M could easily be the Martin inured you find in the later census. Um, he's 6 in 1870. Ten years later, he'd be 16. So that's where it matches. So we're going to piece this family together using the 1850 and 1860 census. And we also want to include some marriage records of some of the children of, of some known children of Abraham and Jane Davis Keener. So we're going to try to recreate this 1870 household of A and J Keener. Basically, I want to make sure I am with the right family and that I'm not dealing with another family that may be in the same area. So here's an abstract that I've pieced it together based on other information. So based on the other census records and based on some marriage records, I can actually put names now to those initials. So we have Abram as the father, Jane as the mother. Then the kids being Isaac, Morgan, Mary, Martha, and Elsa A. And then you have an, it could be a possibly Albert Enyard, and then you have a Martin Enyard. Now, if you're paying attention, and I've mentioned this before, there are two Martin Enyards, both age 16, both born in Indiana. Um, he's been enumerated twice in the same census. Is this possible? Let's take a look and see. Um, in 1880, he is with his grandfather, Abram L. Keener, in Polk Township, Huntington County, Indiana. He is also in the 1880 census listed as a border with Isaac Keener. So when you're looking at the census records, it's very important to pay attention to the enumeration date. In the 1880 census, when he's residing with Isaac Keener, um, that census taker recorded a date as the 1st of June, 1880. 17, 18 days later, this Martin Inyard is located in Huntington County in Indiana, living with his maternal grandfather. And I've shown a map here of Indiana, and you can see that Wabash and Huntington County are right next to each other. So it is very easy, um, given that there's 17, 18 days in between, that Martin may have been helping out with Isaac on the homes on the farm. And then later decided, you know, was moved in with his grandfather to help out there with the farming. Looking at some of the marriages between 1860 and 1870, and you can find these through Ancestry or Family Search. Hetty A. Keener married a Thomas Miles on April 8, 1860. So she's not going to be listed in the 1870 census. She's going to probably be with her own family. Margaret Ellen Keener married a James Baker. Once again, she's not going to be within the 1870 census. We had Sarah, Sarah C. Keener, who married Joshua Inyard on January 31st, 1863. Take note, there are two Inyard boys, once again, residing with Abraham Keener in the 1870 census. There is an A and there is a, an M. Um, they were seven and six. So they very well could be the children of this Sarah and this Joshua Inyard. We know that Morgan marries Clarissa, July 8, 1874. Not sure about Mary Keener. I haven't found where she died or, you know, if she married. Martha, the twin, is still single in the 1880 census. I followed up on her, and she died in 1910. She was never married. There is an Elsa who never married. Um, in her death certificate, she is listed as Anna Eliza. So I think Elsa and Rhoda and Anna Eliza are all the same person, but I'm going to set that problem aside for another day. I need to verify that information. Um, Elsa A. Keener, he, she appears at least with two other names, Rhoda and Anna. So that's why I just know I don't want to focus on that at this point. The other conflict I need to try to resolve would be this A. Inyard. Is this the seven-year-old boy listed in 1870 census? Is he the son or the actual grandson of Abraham or, Ab Abram or Abraham and Jane Keener? In 1870, he is listed as an A. Inyard. 1880, he is listed underneath Albert W. Keener. He is the oldest of the two boys. On his marriage record to Clara Richardson, in 1886, he gives his parents as Abraham and Jane Davis Keener. 
Albert dies in 1887, so I'm leaving no issue. So I have really no other paper trail to try to figure him out. Also keep in mind that Sarah C. Keener married Joshua Inyard. Albert was born sometime in 1863. They get married in 1863. Albert, you know, dies in, in August of 1887. Um, I'd have to follow through and see if Albert was Anita Inyard or if he was adopted out or just assumed the name of his grandparents since they probably, since grandparents may have raised him since he was an infant. So that's another thing I'd have to try to figure out. We also take a look at, to see if it would be possible for Jane, the mother of Isaac, to actually have a child, namely Albert, in 1863. Jane would have been about 44 if she gave birth in 1863. It is biologically possible for an individual, a uh, 44 year old woman, to give birth. However, if you look at the age gap of five years between Elsa and Albert, I'm going to guess that. Albert is more likely a grandson as opposed to a son. And I'm thinking that Sarah died before 1864, probably shortly after Martin Inyart was born. The father probably did not want probably did not want the responsibility or was not comfortable with raising two young boys. So it's not unusual for the father, who's a young widow, to allow other relatives to actually raise those two kids. But once again, this is a mystery for another time. So in summary, we know that the death certificate of Isaac Keener gave the parents' names as Abraham Keener and Martha Davis. Now the census records only indicate that it's a Jane Davis, or a Jane, not a Martha. Um, we want to make sure we look at the original records. Um, the marriage record of Isaac did not necessarily provide additional clues on Isaac, but it did provide um, clues on his wife. By looking at the original marriage record, we were able to disprove, disprove the marriage date that was given on the two sources, namely the find a grave and then the marriage card. Um, and then, like I said, you know, we found the additional information that was not included in either of those places. We do want to look in all the U.S. Census records because you are going to find clues to other family members. Uh, remember to take a look at the enumeration date. If the enumerator has taken a shortcut in his handwriting and did not include all the given names, you're, you may have to use U.S. Census records, vital records, some um, tombstone inscriptions, some obituaries, other type of sources to try to determine or recreate that family. And of course, you need to recreate that family to make sure that you are tracing the right one. In the U.S. Census records, we do find Isaac Keener residing with Abraham, Abram Keener, and Jane Keener. Now, there is a good possibility that Martha, that the mother is a Martha Jane. She may have went by Jane since Abram and Jane had a daughter named Martha. Now, following up on Martha, I find that she passed away, and she was using the name Martha Jane Keener. So it could be one of those cases that they named this daughter after the mother. Of course, you know, I want to do additional research to determine, you know, what other records would verify if it is Martha Davis or Jane Davis or if it is Martha Jane Davis. I hope this case study was helpful. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to contact me. Um, my email is given here on the screen, dkitko at wcpl.info. You may also contact our department by phone, 330-262-0916. So I do encourage you, if you have any questions about this, if you have any comments, if you have any ideas that you'd like for me to present in um, the YouTube program, please let me know. And like I said, usually the best way to contact me is through email, and I can get back to you at my earliest convenience. So for now, um, go ahead and continue your research. Take some of the information I provided in this case study. You may want to look up some other periodicals and maybe read through some other case studies that may relate more to your family or to the geographic area your family could be in. And uh, just go ahead and study and think outside the box. 
So once again, if you have any questions or comments, please contact me at dkitko at wcpl.info. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to the, this latest case study. I hope this case study, as well as many others, has been useful for you. Um, I hope you're gathering some type of information. And I want to remind you there's a lot of other YouTube videos on the Wayne County Public Library site. So feel free to browse. Um, there's several about crafting and um, eating healthy and do-it-yourself projects, as well as several other YouTube videos on how to do genealogy and some local history stuff as well. So if you have not subscribed yet, I would encourage you to subscribe to the uh, Wayne County Public Library YouTube page. Thank you for tuning in. I'll catch you next time. Thanks. Bye.